Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Take the little uh, hooks and eyes and take them off, and then he takes them and put the little rats at the top and put the roll through it, and then he wheel it down to me and we clean them and put them away. It was part of uh, and the ritual. It was part of it. At that point, like, what did that go for you? Just do basic maintenance of your house, and that's how you mean it. But it forced my father to look at the windows every year, so if there was paint to get ready to touch it up, if there was a little bit of hot there, back in the old days, we used to use a little bit of Bondo, we wanted to use Bondo for this product. We learned the hard way. The reason we don't use it in storing cars is the same reason we don't use it on wood. It doesn't track and stand with wood, and it actually absorbs moisture instead of pellet. We use architectural hosties today. I mean, I train all the National Park Service uh, preservation people, and we train to these types of architectural hosties for small amounts of rock. Um, so, knowing that people got used to just, you know, being able to raise that window and break the fingernails on, um, I designed a storm 30 years ago and gave six different regional builder companies to the gym. And they all, when you were asked, I had one of the previous companies that makes it. It's a little storm that has either self storing screens and glass, like the aluminum, or removable glass panels with the closet. Screen or you can get them a full screen on it because they're year round and you just take the glass panels out in the summer when you want to your windows. That way, the wood frame of the storm always stays in place, but you are able to change out screens and storms from inside the house without it getting on the And that storm, the removable panels, will turn the bubbles and take the glass out from the inside, put the screen in, rated as the best or uh, the least air infiltration. All the storm windows that we did. And I would have thought that the, the traditional glass storm and putty that we used would have been better with the, the weather seals on these inserts that are really tight and make a pretty good for job. So I understand what you're saying, but there's lots of alternatives and have been for a long time out there that make it so you can use the wood storm. Most of your house had wood storm. As I was driving around, you could see the rack holes above the windows where all the, all the houses. All the historic houses in your community all have wood storms and screens. You can take a wood storm and convert it into a convertible. If you route it out and go to the hardware store and have them make a little aluminum frame with a little sugar, you can do it. You can put it in there with some you've got to convert the storm. So you can do that as well. So what else have their hand up? Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. You mentioned carbon energy. If I recall correctly, within the last six, eight years, at my property, I replaced the windows. There were fiberglass, and if I'm not mistaken, there was actually an enhancement tax rebate. Yes, there was. Why if it was wasted money? It's fascinating. Please. So, uh, whether you like our current administration or not, uh, I did have a <coughs> today with being preservation friendly. The uh, Obama administration has been the least preservation friendly administration in my life. Uh, they gave tax credits for putting in plastic windows. They gave tax credits for doing the number one thing that you should never do to an old frame house, blow insulation into the sidewalls. Never. It's one of the worst things you can possibly do to an old frame house. And our client, believe it or not. Why? And uh, well, I'll get into that. But the uh, so so but when we went to that with all this data is that but when we restore windows, it's it's more green, so it's green is going to work you. And uh, we, we couldn't even get a meeting. And we got no, if you put on a luminous storm, you got a tax credit. But if you put on a wood storm, you got nothing. So it, it's just a closed year. We couldn't get anybody to, uh, to even discuss it with us. But all this data is just absolutely astonishing. So. Another question. Yeah. In your presentation, I hear this condemnation about the client. Mm -hmm. Are there any high end window companies if I were to get a Old property, let's just say the wood windows are destroyed after your place. Can I go to an XYZ company and get localized, highly efficient wood frame windows and door and so on? Yes. You go to a regional lower companies. Thank you. Do not, the big window companies. Oh, I will tell you that Marvin, how many people have heard of Marvin? Marvin is the only major manufacturer that makes wood storm. Stock I have they sell. It's a self-storing. They're built backwards. They look, they're wooden, they have 
We say at the goal of your school, which is our house and school and athletic practice, we say 15 to 20% of energy costs a year by using our windows as they were designed to use. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of savings. And I'm a big one for that boy. I love the cool air conditioning. But uh, the fact is, is that if we use our windows right now, these houses are built for airflow. If we just seal them all up, it's like the, the federal government. Uh, HUD-based energy efficiency program where they go out and help uh, low and moderate income households energy, do energy retrofits on their houses. They're caulking the windows shut. They're caulking the windows shut. And they're doing all kinds of crazy things to these historic houses that make no sense whatsoever. So regional lower companies are the best way to do it. Uh, there's one down in Kansas City called Review. There's one in Review, Iowa called Review Sash. And they will make competitive with Marvin and Anderson and Pella. Pella, you go here. You know, Pella used to be a Cadillac winner. Used to be a Cadillac winner. They made the worst winner in America. And the president of Pella calls me up once a year. And he says, I heard you were training architects for continuing education. And I said, Yeah, you do that quite a bit. You were slamming Pella windows again. I said, Yeah, you were really bad. <laughs> and there's always this pause because I know you knew.
If you just put a storm on, you're equal or better in energy efficiency than if you do nothing with the windows. Storm, next year's storm is an astonishing thing in all the testing and how well it stops air infiltration. It creates a two plus inch barrier. Right? So an in insulated glass window has about half an inch, so much five inches. <coughs>
And then you start to look at commercial windows and residential windows after 10 or 12 years, and you will start to see this condensation building up. And then if there are blue windows, that also creates more opportunity for rot, all kinds of issues. So there's, there's just a lot of data out there. The problem is that the consumers are not getting to it, and, and we need to. So on these are we feeling? There's a real uh, uh, precedent in historic houses for awnings. And the Department of Energy uh, windows and awnings can reduce solar gain in the summer with 65% south facing windows and 77% on west facing windows. Now, you, if you live in a historic property that's listed and you have to go and collaborate with your commission, you don't call it a commission, you call it what? Just the board, the board of preservation. The board of preservation is what it's called. And around the country, we call it historic preservation. They're all uh, appointed people from your community to sit on this board. And it's a collaborative group. They're not there to be the main police. They're there to work with you and help you keep your properties. Because if you are working on your old house and it's sort of all these neighborhoods that we're giving these wonderful stories today, if, if, if people in that neighborhood are trying to retain the character of their house and you don't have an ordinance that protects the entire neighborhood, that somebody can go into the siding on a house and replace the windows and buy and your property values go down. Immediately. Property values in classic neighborhoods don't go up when you put on a siding on a windows and they go down. It's the first sign that the neighborhood is in decline is when the replacement products start to go on. And this is just statistically a fact. But Don Griffma, Don Griffma, who is an economist in Washington, D.C., has done all these studies in the Midwest about values economics of preservation and study after study after study work from appraisers, architects, city staff people, zoning folks, all across the entire Midwest has shown that when you're in a neighborhood of classic style houses and you start to take away the original character on the outside, the value of that house goes down as much as 10 to 15 percent of the minute that side of those windows are in there. And the house next door that's done the right thing with their house, their value goes down as well. So, by not having a preservation ordinance, you're taking away property rights from the people that are trying to do the right thing. That's not, not right. That's not, that's not a good Midwestern method. And the other thing that I'll say just on the end of that is that I, I, I'm finishing up a book right now called Future Slum. It's a comparison between turnaround central city and historic neighborhoods that are about 100. 3,000 square foot houses in that neighborhood, 3,000 square foot houses in the line of the village of the sound. And we, we sent out questionnaires to appraisers and architects across the country. We've been doing this data now for eight years. And uh, normally, if you get 3% response back in these kinds of questionnaires, you're doing really well. We were trying to, uh, we were getting over 60% of these questionnaires returned at that. Because it's a hot, it's a hot issue with appraisers and architects. One of the questions we asked is, in your opinion, what's the functional and economic life of a house being built in a suburban cornfield today? 3,000 square feet. And the response was absolutely astonishing. The architects and appraisers, the average response was 27 point three years. Before that house would either have to be gutted or torn out. What's being built today? The next question, side of that is, here's a 100-year-old house, 3,000 square feet, in a turnaround central city neighborhood, it's being rehabbed from the ground up, the ground to the roof, and everything in between. What's the functional and economic life of that rehab? 83 plus years, and you've done again. So, what's the scale? You sit on an airport airplane with a guy that's responsible for building all the new post offices. <coughs> And you know, he's traveling around the country overseeing the building of the I said, what's the primary material you're using? It's, uh, dry it. Dry it is a synthetic stuff. You know? I did one of my PBS shows, we took a child's hammer, went all over the country and tapped on this stuff and made dents on it, we didn't scurry off. We never did get arrested, but I was sure we were going to. <laughs> and it was just garbage. And I said, what's the economic and functional life of a post office you're building today? He said, 30 years max. And I, and I, I beat on my bosses at the federal government. I 
I've shown them that for 12% more, we can get a 100-year life. 12% more, we can get a 100-year life out of those buildings that they have money to do it. For the fire, they might have to bring them So it's just interesting how we are, have built obsolescence into what we're doing in this country. Any questions before I go on? So while every building is different and the orientation of the sun varies, awnings can potentially save 10 to 25 percent a year. Look at awnings, they're a good thing. Retractable awnings are really good thing. This is downtown Hamble, this is 1869. Uh, this is old Mr. Cameron. And uh, his family still lives in Hannibal, the Camerons do. We have lots of multi-generational people from the 1830s that like, stayed in Hamble. They don't like us outsiders. We, all of the Mark Twain historic district, all shops and everything that creates $30 million in tourism uh, dollars in Hamble here, not one of them is owned by somebody from Hamble. They're all of my people, my, my wife and I love Hamble and move here. And that's not but so here's a retractable line that, that he's using across the uh, street from this. This is the Java Jive. It's the first coffee house west of the Mississippi. Uh, sort of not, but it's the first one to see. <laughs> um, my buddy Steve and his wife have a gift shop on the left. Java Jive is just fabulous, overstuffed and comfy uh, coffee house that we all hang on. We have like, several different flyers clubs. But uh, those are all retractable awnings, and Steve gets out every day and takes his little crank and cranks them in and out depending on where the sun is. Another one is masonry. Now, uh, a lot of buildings in your downtown made of masonry. How many people have a residential house that's masonry made out of brick or stone? Few. So masonry matters for energy efficiency big time. This particular building has a lot of mortar missing and some cracks, a little bit of settling. Nothing horribly structurally wrong with it, but if they don't get in and repoint this, that's take the bad mortar out and put the mortar in. Uh, tuck pointing is has nothing to do with that. So it's just interesting to me. Uh, I'll tell you that. So in England, all rich people were having their houses built, all everybody's built with masonry, everything. Uh, and they had these really thin mortar joints. And in America, we call them butter joints. Very thin, eighth of an inch thin. You know, normal mortar joints, anywhere from three eighths to a half an inch. These are real thick. And it took the best mason to build it because you had to have very uniform, little thin mortar joints, and the brick had to be more uniform so it would cost more and all this. And so all these rich people in England were building their houses this way, and the working folks said, wait a minute, we want butter joints. And the mason said, you can't afford butter joints, but here's what we'll do for it. We'll do a half inch mortar joint, but we'll color the mortar the same color as the brick. And then we'll tuck point a little line down the middle of the mortar, the gray mortar in there. So when you're standing on the street, it looks like you have butter joints. That's called tuck point. How that ever got transformed into uh, removing mortar and putting it new in this country, I will never understand. But that's the vernacular, so uh, I'll use the term tuck point, even though it makes my teeth with that one. Um, and, and this has some bad repointing too. If you look up at the top, there's some, some bad hard mortar. You never want your mortar to be harder than the face of the unit. In other words, you never want your mortar to be harder than a stone or brick that you're putting in because the stone and brick attracts and expands. And if the mortar is hard, it doesn't move with the brick. It makes the brick crack and it can cause all kinds of problems. But air infiltration is huge around. Insulating your building. The idea is to make a building as energy efficient as possible without doing harm to structural and architectural elements. Here is an example of a solid brick building in downtown Hamble. And they have put a frame wall on the inside of it. Of it. And uh, the insulation is right up against the brick wall. So they did this because they wanted their building to be more energy efficient. And what they found out was that it actually decreased the energy efficiency of the building and caused horrible mold. And the reason it does is this. Brick takes in and lets out moisture constantly. In fact, an old historic brick over 100 years will increase in size, height, width, and length over 100 years by sometimes as much as a 16. 
sixteenth of an inch. Sometimes it's 164, it just depends, but it will grow. Because every time it takes in moisture over the years, it increases the cell structure inside the brick, and the brick actually grows. So a brick has to constantly be able to let in and let out moisture. And it's a three brick thick wall, and so the thermal mass of that brick wall is now completely void because it has insulation over it. None of the heat or air conditioning that's going on inside this building can now reach the brick. And the insulation is touching the brick and getting wet because of the moisture coming in and out of the brick and it's dropping down and causing black mold inside this building. And we got all this out this was really three years ago. Um, when we talk about thermal mass, so we get all the calculations. I did this, what I'm showing you here is something I did for the National Main Street Program. Um, we did a lot of research so you take a three brick thick wall or a party wall. That's where two buildings in a downtown Main Street chain share the same interior wall. Mm -hmm. And you calculate, start the heating season, starts to heat up the brick, starts to do a the brick retains the heat until you get to, you know, somewhere in late January, early February, when it gets really bitter and it starts to lose some of its effectiveness and it doesn't retain as much heat. In the summer air conditioning. Start the season up, starts to cool the brick down, starts to do a really good job, and you get into about mid-August when it's you know 90, even 90 percent humidity, it has less of an effect. But it has a greater effect at insulating that building over the entire year, both from air conditioning and heat, than insulating the walls, the interior walls of that building. So you actually don't save energy by putting in a sub wall on the of brick. You move, you, it costs you more energy and it can cause all kinds of moisture problems. Anybody have a question about that? So here's down in a basement, like stone foundation. You have a box sill. A box sill is where you have the joists rest on top of the foundation and in between the joists. And we always come in here and we caulk and we insulate in here. I use rigid foam insulation and friction fitted in there and caught that because it's a huge air filtration area and an area where you can get a lot of uh, you need some thermal capability because it's really just wood exposed to the outside. So that's down in your basement on top of the foundation you want to do that. This is a baby poop sprayed on the ceiling of the wall. That's sort of what it looks like. That. This is soy foam. The soy foam is, is a great product. I thought, you know, so back in the 70s, they had foam insulation. Everybody was blowing it into the walls of their old houses. It did two things. It called, caused catastrophic plastic failures across the country because they couldn't control the foam expansion. And it would expand in the cavity and push the lath away from the stud wall. And so that the, the plastic was attached to the wood lath and it would cause catastrophic plaster failures. We saw that all across the country, and it had so much formaldehyde in it, it was making everybody in the home sick. So the federal government outlawed foam insulation. Then in the 1980s, late 1980s, they came back. We have foam insulation now, and it doesn't have formaldehyde. You can't make foam without formaldehyde. Well, that's true, but it's, oh, it's up to the, the maximum amount of the federal government. But they're telling consumers there's no formaldehyde. Second of all, they're saying, doesn't shrink. Oh my God, what a lie. It does shrink. This was in here for less than a month. You see all that white all the, all, along the edge there? That's all shrinking away about a quarter of an inch from the joists of the ceiling of this seventh floor loft in the downtown party hall. Plus, she left it all open. Now, that's the roof structure. If it leaks, the moisture is going to come down on top of the foam. She's never going to know where that is, or maybe never even know there is a leak until it's rotten. All the wood is soaked up, everything on the decking, and everything, and it's not reversible. The foam gets in there and eats the soft pit of the wood. That's called the spring and summer wood, the light grain. Dark grain is called winter wood. That's when in the winter time is where it gets it's really strong and hunkers down and does that. And the, the, the formaldehyde in the foam eats away the soft pit, or what we call the spring and summer wood. 
It's just, it, it's crazy. So it's shrinking. We're opening up walls where it's been in walls four, five, six years. Uh, and this old house does it all the time. And we're finding that it's shrinking. Because they're claiming that's an air, uh, it stops air filtration. But of course it doesn't, especially since it shrinks. So it, 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 and it can cause all kinds of problems. So, anybody have any questions about that? Let's talk about insulation in the side walls of an old house. How many people have seen a new house being built, a skeleton of a new house being built? Right. And what do you notice? They frame the house up, they put sheathing on the outside, and then they put Tyvek on it, leave it in the sun for about a month or two. Right? I love that. Since Tyvek's warranty is void, it's in direct sunlight for more than 10 days. And we'll go back, some builders will have it on there for two months, and we'll go back and look at those houses 10 years later, and the Tyvek is done with dust. Tie back is not a side material. Um, so they, they frame up the house, they put the tie back and sheeting on the outside, and then they come inside and put insulation between the stuff. Right? And in our climate, what do you have to do before the drywall goes over that exterior wall? You have to have a paper curtain. It has four mil plastic uh, polyethylene <coughs> sheeting that goes on over the insulation, and then the drywall goes on over the back. That's called a paper curtain. Paper barriers always go on the inside of an exterior wall. That's because we create more and more papers in our house. We're cooking, we're plants, showers, dishwashers, uh, things that you do in private that I won't say. We create a lot of moisture. It's just the nature of how human beings do. We breathe. And all this moisture isn't attracted up, it isn't attracted down. The way air moves in the house. It finds the hairline cracks in your walls, the casings are the <coughs> around your windows, your outlets, your switch covers, and it enters the exterior wall. In new construction, that moisture can't get to the insulation because there's plastic underneath the drywall. In your old house, with lath and plaster, is there a plastic membrane underneath the plaster? No. The minute you put insulation into the side walls of a plastered house, you will have catastrophic pain failure for the rest of that house's life. In over 80% of the houses that we've tested from coast to coast, uh, everything north of Mason Dixon, it's a little different animal down in the southwest, down in Florida, and those kinds of places. But north of the southern line that runs along southern Missouri all across the country, north of that area, including us, uh, what we're finding is we're reaching into the wall, all of the insulation. Down at the bottom of the wall cavity is up. Uh, we pull it out and I can bring a cup of water out uh, of the termites. I have a contract with Nauvoo. Nauvoo is where Joseph Smith was murdered. Uh, the guy that runs Nauvoo's historic houses is a guy named Lash McKay. And he is a descendant of Joseph Smith, a direct descendant. He's part of a family that stayed behind and didn't go west over the young. And I asked him, I said, so how did your Great, 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 great grandfather did kill me. It's not written anymore. His wife, my great, 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 great grandmother, all had assassinated because he came home and said he wanted to work one wife. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not. It's not written down anymore, but that's what he told me. So, Joseph Smith's original house there, 1850, 1849, frame house, wood, wood studs, clapboard. It couldn't get painted all. Big chunks of it were falling off. And I went over there and I put my moisture meter on it. I always have a moisture meter so I can tell what the moisture content is. Because if you paint a house that's over 15% moisture content of wood, you don't get failure in five years, you get failure immediately. It's too wet for paint to adhere to. And I tested everything, it was all over 65% moisture content in the clapboard. And I said, well, do you have long insulation in here? Oh, no, Bob, we would never do that. We would never do that. This is a young maintenance guy. I said, well, is there an older guy in town? And he said, yeah, he's 88 years old. And he had my job, and I replaced him. I said, can you call him? Call him, I was thrilled. He said, no, we never did that. So I said, okay, we got to get inside the wall so it's happening. So I drilled a hole about six inches in diameter, down just above the foundation, above. This was made with still being big eight, nine inch by nine inch still so I get above that. 
pulled the drill out, and we stood there for 20 minutes watching the carpenter ants come out. That's how long it had. I had to wait before I could reach in, get the blown in cellulose insulation, and squeeze the couple off. So they had to take all that side off the house and remove it because they didn't want to remove all the plaster from the inside. It's all original. And um, they had to take it all out and dry it out and have it all treated because it was black and mold and all kinds of work. I see this everywhere I go. People say, well, if I can't insulate my house, how can I afford living? There's no payback in insulating the side walls of a house. It will take you 40 years to pay for a standard blow in job and the side walls of a frame house. You save enough energy to pay for that job in 40 years. And that's assuming that nothing bad can happen, like I just described. But it does all day long. The issue is air filtration. Paint and caulk your house well. Weather strip your windows and doors. And that stops the majority of air infiltration. But you don't want to stop at all. Because if you stop all the air infiltration, it's like living in a doubled up garbage bag that has duct tape around the goose net on it. And your kids will get sick. I testify in court about air, air, bad air in houses, and I've never testified about one in an old house. Always new construction because they're made up too tight. So, so how long do we have to remake the house? Is it funny? Is it a wood house? Serious black mold in those walls. Um, 
that's that, that really dangerous kind of black hole. Yes? I'm very confused. I'm volunteering on restoration of autos for an engineer. Are you suggesting that we just tear everything off the retainer and the laughing off is on the sand and horse air? There's the outside, the inside of the exterior wall. Are you suggesting that we just sheetrock the wall and do nothing in that cavity whatsoever? Please, I missed what we're supposed to do. If you keep, if you don't, don't get rid of your laughing plastic. You can't get a, a wall. Well, a lot of it's broken. Right, right. right. So, so, so if you have to gut a room, you yes, treat it like new construction. Please. You insulate the side wall and you put four mil plastic vapor barrier over that and then you put your drywall or if you're going to go back with plastic, you can do that too. Um, from a practical standpoint, it's hard to go back with plastic in plastic on houses. So I tend to use either two layers of half inch or five eighths inch drywall because if your window frames stick out far enough, you want them to be flush and you can trim that. Uh, so that, yes, if you've got a gut wall, you treat it like new Excuse me, but I understood you to say, don't put the film on or don't insulate. My notes are confusing myself. Well, if you have plaster that you're keeping, yes. no don't blow insulation off. If you've got it, let's say, let's take a kitchen. You've got it, if you're running a new system using wiring and plumbing to the upstairs, and you're, you've got it in the kitchen, Please. then you want to treat it like the construction. Put the insulation on the sidewalls, put the four mil plastic vapor barrier over it, dry it. Because the wall is open, and you can get the plastic vapor barrier in there. You can't get a plastic vapor barrier behind plastic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Yes. We just bought an uh, old house in July. And uh, is there an easy way to determine what is inside the walls or if anything for insulation? Usually you can go out and see if there are any of fashionable plastic plugs. That, that will tell you if you've had plumbing insulation. Or you can pop off a piece of siding. Uh, down low, close to the foundation. Uh, find one that has a joint that's short. Pop, pop it off carefully, and, uh, and you, you you should be able to poke around in between the sheathing underneath and see if there's anything. In there. All right. So HVAC. So here's that old octopus furnace. I always hire a uh, mechan uh, mechanical engineer to tell me whether to keep it. This one he told me to get rid of. This one is an old steam weather that just was on its last leg and. So much asbestos on it that we had to get rid of. But radiator heat is fantastic. People get rid of it all the time. Don't get rid of radiator heat. Radiators get hot, they stay hot. They're architectural. Uh, they can be adapted to geothermal. They can be adapted to off the use, you know, use radiator floor heating off of a boiler system with the right regulators and those kinds of things. They're just fantastic. And uh, steam and or hot water. Hot water systems. Piping will last forever because there's no air in it. Uh, steam works off an angle with the pipes, and there's air in the pipes, and that's how the steam travels up through the piping. So there's a dirtier system, and the piping in an old steam system can go bad and rot away. But in most hot water boiler systems, the piping will last indefinitely. Uh, this is a, a, a traditional ducting for a downdraft furnace. So you have, a, you have a conventional furnace, high efficiency side vent furnace up in an attic. And this is a gutted space where they're running. This is the trunk for the, for the, uh, for the supplies for the air conditioning and heating. And then there are returns elsewhere. This is a conventional boiler. And uh, not very efficient. You're going to run in the 80% range. 82%. This is a Wild McLean, one of the big companies that makes these hot boilers. And you can get about 82% efficiency. But this is the lunch. This, this is made in Germany. And it's about this thick. And it will, the boy, and it side vents out the side so you don't have to use a chimney. And it will, the boiler, that little tiny boiler this big will, will, will do a 4,000 square. An amazing thing. The payback on it's really quick because uh, its uh, energy efficiency is much higher than the high 90s. These are look like portables and speaker. This is a high velocity, high pressure 
heating and air conditioning system. I use this whenever I have radiators in a boiler system and I need air conditioning. The ducts are as big around as a vacuum cleaner comes. And the, the air handler that does the air conditioning, and it'll also do heat, uh, pushes the heat through these ducts at high pressure, high velocity, so that when the air comes into the room, it circulates and makes every square inch of the air in that room the same. And that can be adapted as well to geothermal and some other types of things. Now, geothermal, does anybody here have geothermal? I, I've had some pushback from folks uh, in Minneapolis and probably here that the impression is that geothermal won't work here. But, but it, believe me, it does work. Um, it takes the temperature of the ground and handles 52 degrees, same temperature it is in the Mark Twain cave in January as it is in June. And it takes the 52 degree temperature of the ground through these loops going down into the ground. Now we have, you know, at, at our school, we put in geothermal. This is the piping. And they dug 10, 250 foot deep vertical wells inside of our, our historic house. And the piping goes down, comes back up, four feet below the ground, goes through a trench to the next well and down. So it picks up that 52 degree temperature in 10 wells. And remember, ours is a 10 ton system. A normal house would have a two or three ton system. This is five stories, 8,000 square feet. And uh, uh, so air conditioning in the summer is virtually free. It heats all of our hot water. So we don't ever have, we have these electric water tanks, 50 gallon water tanks, two of them, hot water tanks, standard, that we've never turned the elements on, they're just holding tanks with geothermal. We put the steaming hot water into, so we don't have to pay for that. Uh, the pipes come in underground, they go up into the joist system, <coughs> and they come over to the air handler. There's no compressor unit outside like a conventional air conditioner. It's like a Prius, it's so quiet, it's scary. And so we've zoned the house with, with electronic dampers on the cold air return and the supplies uh, in four different zones throughout the house. So bed and breakfast, so the guest rooms are on one. Uh, my offices and the kitchen and the uh, common areas are on another. And it works incredibly well. There's one of the, uh, the food dampers right there. Um, so geothermal cost me $43,000. The house had never had ductwork. Uh, it had been heated with coal fireplaces and stoves originally, and then the slumlords moved in and put these cheesy little slumlord furnaces all over the window air conditioners. And our average monthly heating and cooling costs were right around $1,600 a month. And that's a lot. And we're down every 300 pay for itself 3.7 years or 3.9. What I want to show you here, hang on, let's go down. So this is a downtown uh, historic department store in Hanover. And originally, the people that were friends of ours that owned it, down here, underneath all the windows, it's on a corner, so it had windows on two sides, big picture windows like a department store right now. He built boxes underneath the windows and ran the ductwork underneath the windows. And then he put art displays on top of the built-in boxes. This is long continuous and the ductwork was hidden inside. The people that bought it wanted it to look like a warehouse. So they put in the spiral ductwork and their energy costs went up 22%. Because they're up on 16 foot ceilings, <coughs> trying to get the heat to come down. Instead of running it underneath the windows, best way to do it, and they wanted that funky look. The Chamber of Commerce used to be in this building. They couldn't afford the heat bill, so they moved into that other little building I showed you before. Uh, it makes a big difference. So this is the uh, energy retrofit case. This is the Landmonger house. This is the house where my school the bed and breakfast is. And that's a picture of it from 1860. That's a, a painting. This is a picture of the house right after we put the missing front porch back on this. We, all, we now have the house is completely restored, so this picture is a little dated. But it's 7,900 square feet on a corner lot. It's a party wall in the south. 
party walls and adjoining brick wall in the south is because the slave house is attached to the back. And I grew up in Des Moines, and when, you, know, you know that Hannibal with Mark Twain and Jim and all that moved there and realized that Hannibal had more slaves per capita than any city in the country. It was entirely Confederate. Uh, there, there were no farms in Hannibal, but every the African American slave population in Hannibal until the day the Civil War ended was 42 percent of the population, and within six months it dropped down to one and a half percent. Uh, go figure. Right? So they all went to Des Moines, Kansas City, anywhere they could go to get out of Hannibal. Um, it's three uh, brick thick stone foundation, uh, frame and roof. Uh, window restoration uh, cost $350 for each of the 42 windows. That included a wood storm. Now, I'm a developer, so I made a wood storm. Wood storm cost about 150 bucks. The rest of it was the labor for the weather stripping. But remember, these windows already had weather stripping on them. All we had to do was clean it up and put back in. And then we had to redo the putty and re roll them. Um, so we spent almost 15000 on that. Uh, we did air, uh, air plugging of. Uh, pipes and electrical things going up into the attic. We sealed off all these penetrations. We weather stripped all the doors. Uh, we put in the geothermal after the 30% tax credit came in 29.4. So our total energy retrofits were 47,000. Original annual gas costs were 19,000. Now it's 6,900. Uh, we saved 12, almost 12,500 dollars a year and the payback was 3.8 years. And it works in your climate. It works in your climate. And people think it, it's automatically assumed because it's very cold here in the winter that it doesn't work. Trust me, it does work. And the payback is less than four years. That's astonishing. And I, every commercial building I do now, I do thermal, geothermal. And I do it in towels. I have to get the city to let me drill in the alley to get the wells. Because you can't do these big horizontal fields, you have to do the vertical wells. But in, in Pittsburgh, we've got. Uh, I was involved in a project where you had a corner and you had all these row houses, six row houses here, six row houses here. Went in the back and drove 22 wells in the back. And they all pitched in together, all 12 condos, row houses. Bought the equipment for less than conventional equipment because they were buying the bulk. Put it all in and everybody's up on the same grid, so to speak. Now those houses all have solar panels all over their semi-flat roofs. And they are now selling energy back to a power company in Pittsburgh instead of paying a penny. It's pretty amazing. We're getting ready to do that with Belvedere. Belvedere is a cupola that sticks out of an Italian eight house. A cupola has beds in it, but Belvedere has windows. Belvedere is the Italian word for beautiful view. And so that's why we have a Belvedere. So this is a bell <coughs> This room right here is 20 feet by 32 feet. It's the biggest bell I've ever seen in the country. I spent all of July restoring what was not an Italian, because this is a bell is a term for this on an Italian account. What they call a cupola in Virginia, an eight-sided cupola over the Hudson River. I got to go out and restore all Eight windows, say inside of what George Washington now burned. That was an amazing gig. Those windows were all dated 1795, and we gave them another 150, 200 year life, restoring all the windows. But they call that a cupola, but technically in the Victorian era, they're called bell meters. So, uh, there is one of the windows before we go to the house. This house was actually painted today. It was the mortar dry and it was built in the The brick domes in Hannibal were so bad. And the, and the Germans over in Quincy across the river hated the Scottish Kentucky Hannibal. They had these great brick domes, but they wouldn't sell us any brick. So this is the first robber baron mansion ever built in Hannibal. The first big house. And all these lawyers and bankers were watching the workers build their little uh, brief, uh, reliable houses, watching them brick mature for the first two or three years. So 
Every single house that was built between 1859 and 1870 in Hannibal was painted with a red line wash, the minute the mortar truck did. But then eventually in the 1930s, they started painting white. And of course, everybody, you know, I get all these little 90 year old old ladies coming up to my house and screaming at me, I can't believe you painted that thing red. It's supposed to be white. And I'm like, well, let's see. Things happen. So there's that window, there's that window. Now that has a wood storm on it. Can you see the divided lights? Can you see the panes, the, the multiple panes in the window? Of course you can. One of the things that people used to say, don't put wood storms on the outside houses because you can't see the divided lights. But these divided lights are the thinnest I've ever done in my life, and you can still see them. There's the window from the inside. And there's the window being used as it's supposed to be used, with the top sash down and the bottom sash up. Humidity up top. And in Hannibal, whatever the temperature is, the humidity is the same. So all summer long, it's like St. Louis, it's 95 to 103 degrees, and the humidity is about the same. So, what kind of temperatures is that the house then? Uh, well, the geothermal? Well, that, that example right there. Right, but until it gets really hot in the summertime, yeah. you keep temperatures right around 72 degrees, which is hollow. And it takes the humidity out too, because that's your big issue, because it's so uncomfortable. So be an educated consumer, energy consumer. I think that's really important. Retrofitting, make the point in your community that retrofitting can be done. Uh, make your buildings more energy efficient and uh, more cost effective. Preserving original windows costs less, it's more energy efficient. Paybacks from between two and 10 years on uh, paybacks for replacement, between 34 to 24 years. Air filtration is number one issue. Replacement products are just that, products you have to replace over and over and over. Exterior wall insulation is expensive and usually damaging, damaging to historic buildings. Historic masonry houses and buildings have thermal mass that retains the heat in winter and cold in the summer. Exposed brick, unless it's a warehouse, is not a good energy. Everybody loves exposed brick. Well, you, you, you go back to the 70s and hang out there, because that's what we used to do. You don't do that anymore. Exposed brick is not a good idea, uh, especially in a building that had plaster over the brick. Uh, if you want to get a tax credit, you'll never get one if you take the plaster, the plaster off. Interior. Part of the thermal mass. This is a, a, a loft, the one that had the baby poop in the rafters. Um, this, she took all the plaster off this brick and she went in to get her tax credit and they denied her tax credit because they told her right up front, they'll take the plaster off the brick and she did it anyway. And so she didn't get her tax credit. And uh, her energy costs went up over when this was just a cheesy rental. Now it's this lovely loft, but it costs more to heat and air condition the space now without that, the added thermal mass of the plaster over the brick. And she doesn't want to caulk these Casings, you can see right around the joints, there's air filtration coming in because she thinks it will look bad. But the, the fact is, it's just not uh, what it's job. Sustainability simply means that with good work that lasts. We've been in this movement. We created the great preservation. All right, anybody have any quick questions? Right. Yes, ma'am. The geothermal unit, the air handling unit inside, takes, extracts the heat out of the building and heats your house down from 52 degree temperature. And it goes through a process. I'm not a, a mechanical engineer, but it, it takes the 52 degrees and converts it into heat. So the only time that the back, there's, there's an electric backup. Don't want the electric backup to go on because it makes your heater smoke like this, right? And you have to remember, it takes the backup for our geothermal built into the unit. Uh, uh, we have eight 220 breakers just for that. Think about it. So we have fireplaces all over the house, and so we put in gas log. And so when it gets into the late January or early February, the temperatures are really frigid. Uh, we, we just turn our little gas fireplaces on because they heat off and then put the And 
gas is cheap. It only happens for a couple of weeks. But it has to be, so it's something you have to think about. Anybody else? Don't come back now, dear.